Committee on the Interior, Energy and the Environment will come to order. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. Uh, we are expecting votes on the floor of the House around 2.30. We would like to get as far as we can, at least through uh, the opening statements and perhaps our witnesses' initial testimony. And then uh, we have a couple of votes. We take the House picture, which actually is very fast, and we will get back here as soon as we can to finish that up. I apologize, but there probably will be about a half hour or so of recess in the middle of this to allow us to, uh, to do our voting. So, um, good afternoon. Today the Subcommittee on Interior, Energy and the Environment will examine the regulation of shark finning in the United States. Despite the fact that shark finning is illegal in U.S. waters, many coastal states continue to face issues with shark finning enforcement. Today, we will explore opportunities to combat the terrible practice of shark finning through discussing issues with enforcement, possible benefits of a ban, and the importance of sharks in the global ocean ecosystem. The United States has made great efforts to protect sharks in our territorial waters by passing the Shark Finning Prohibition Act of 2000 and the Shark Conservation Act of 2010. The 2000 law prohibited the importation of shark fins without the corresponding carcasses and the finning of sharks in U.S. water. The 2010 law went a step further prohibiting U.S. vessels in international waters and all vessels in U.S. waters from transporting shark fins without the corresponding carcasses or from removing any shark fin while at sea. My home state of Texas recently joined the effort to end this inhumane treatment of sharks. On June 10, 2015, Texas became the 10th state to ban the trade of shark fins when Governor Abbott signed HB 1579 into law. Prior to this, Texas had emerged as a hub for shark fins with the state's fin trade growing by 240 percent since 2010 after the passage of fin trade bans in California, Delaware, Hawaii, Illinois, Massachusetts, Maryland, uh, New York, Oregon, and Washington. With the passage of HB 1579, Texas is the first Gulf state to pass a shark fin trade ban, and I'm proud of the effort Texas has made to eliminate the fin trade. Now is the time for the U.S. to prohibit the trade of shark fins completely as well. That's why I've co-sponsored Chairman Royce's bill, the Shark Fin Sales Elimination Act of 2017, which prohibits processing, selling, and purchasing of shark fins at the federal level. In addition to this important piece of legislation, I've also introduced the Justice Attributed to Wounded Sharks Act, or the JAWS Act. This bill would end the United States' importation of seafood products from countries that do not prohibit um, the practice of shark finning. Sharks are a necessary component to a healthy ocean, yet millions of sharks are uh, traded annually for their fins, leaving certain species uh, increasingly vulnerable, if not endangered. Without sharks, the ocean's ecosystems would be unbalanced. Sharks maintain uh, equilibrium and order by ensuring population control and habitat boundaries, which is a critical component for ocean life. It's my hope that this hearing today will allow us to pinpoint solutions that will protect sharks and put an end to the in inhumane practice of shark finning. Uh, I'll now recognize the uh, ranking member of the subcommittee, Ms. Plaskett, from the Virgin Islands, for her opening statement. Uh, Ms. Plaskett, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. We can all agree that sharks play an invaluable role in our ecosystem. I believe we can also agree that this is concerning that the shark population continues to decline. We as Americans and citizens of this world can do more to stop this decline. However, what I cannot agree on is the need for a hearing on shark finning today instead of an ongoing, the, uh, a hearing on the ongoing humanitarian crisis in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Mr. Chairman, most of my constituents remain in the dark because utility service has not been reestablished since Hurricanes Irma and Maria. According to reporting by the Miami Herald, two months after Hurricane Irma and one month after Hurricane Maria, and I quote, less than a third of the St. Thomas residents, 16% of the St. Croix customers, which is where I live, and hardly anyone on St. John has power. Unlike Florida and Texas, normal life has not resumed in the U.S. Virgin Islands. There are children who still do not have a school to go to. According to the Miami Herald, many schools are still too damaged to reopen 
others are destroyed, are still in use as shelters, limited curfews are still in effect. The curfew was lifted a day ago, but the schools are still closed in many instances. I am very concerned about the likelihood of many Virgin Islands residents who depend on tourism for their income. On September 29th, Ranking Member Cummings and I requested the Chairman Gowdy hold an emergency hearing on the humanitarian crisis caused by the hurricanes in the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. Chairman Gowdy declined this request and held member-only briefings with FEMA, the Department of Defense, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Department of Health and Human Services. I'm grateful for those briefings, but that is not a hearing, and it would have been nice if I had been consulting as to the time of those briefings, since in more than one instance I was traveling back to the ravaged Virgin Islands. Although the daily experiences of my constituents would have been highly relevant, two of these briefings were scheduled at times when I was traveling. It is long past the time for the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to conduct oversight hearings on the slow and ineffective response to the devastation. I know that our pre president has said that it's a 10 out of 10, but living on the islands, I do not feel that. Caused by the hurricanes in the U.S. territories of Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, with all due respect to this chairman, Chairman Farenholt, the witnesses and the many people who, like me, care deeply about the survival of sharks in our ecosystem. We have many in the Caribbean and throughout our island. It is offensive that we are holding a hearing on this subject at a time when the U.S. Virgin Islands does not have one fully functioning hospital. Mr. Chairman, there is no better time to reach across the aisle than this. American citizens in the U.S. Virgin Islands are suffering and questioning if their government is concerned about them or has forgotten about them. Let's answer these questions and resolve their fears with the resounding, no, we're here for you, we're looking out for you. And then let's prove it by conducting hearings on the slow and ineffective federal response to the hurricanes in the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. Thank you. If the gentlelady will yield for a second, I have had uh, conversations with the chairman of the full committee on this issue. There is some concern that uh, our in uh, doing oversight at this time might further slow the recovery e efforts. No one is more sympathetic uh, than I am because we went through something very similar uh, in the district I represent. Um, the, the, many of the towns that I represent were devastated. We had the advantage, of course, of not being an island and the necessary relief and repair efforts were much easier uh, to uh, get to our physical location. But you can uh, please accept my promise that this will be looked into uh, because not only do I have uh, friends in the Virgin Islands, uh, I also fully understand what it is like to, uh, I mean, I, it was tough for me going a week without electricity. I can't imagine uh, going a, a month without electricity. I, I did learn pretty much everything I like to do and everything I like to eat requires electricity. <laughs> so uh, you, you have my assurance that we're going to uh, do our best to do oversight onto, uh, in, into this matter and uh, do everything that we can to make sure that we are better prepared uh, to deal with uh, disasters both on the mainland and on um, the islands like Puerto Rico and the, and the Virgin Islands. Uh, and in fact, I'm uh, planning on speaking again to uh, the chairman about it uh, today because I do think uh, it is time to uh, to get to get moving on this. And I agree, he does have a tendency to schedule things on fly-in days when those of us who are further away have trouble getting here. So rest assured, we will work on it. Thank you. And this and this hearing has been in the planning stages for uh, several months. Thank you. So thank you very much. With that. Um, I'd like to uh, take a moment to uh, introduce our witnesses. Uh, Ms. Laura Snyder is the campaign director for Oceana International Headquarters. Uh, welcome. We have Assistant Commander Game Warden Brandy L. Reeder. Uh, she is a fisheries law administrator for the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department Law Enforcement Division, and I'm happy to be talking to somebody about fisheries enforcement on something other than Red Snapper. 
And then uh, we have uh, Dr. D.M. Dove. He's Vice President of Research and Conservation for the Georgia Aquarium. I was tempted to invite uh, someone from the Texas State Aquarium, but we didn't want to be too uh, Texas heavy, and we really do appreciate uh, your coming up from Georgia to uh, visit with you. Uh, so uh, welcome to all of you. Pursuant to committee rules, uh, we ask that you rise and be sworn in before you testify. Would you please stand and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Let the uh, records uh, reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Y'all may be seated. All right, well, in order to allow time for uh, discussion and uh, so we can hopefully get the initial statements done before votes, uh, we ask that you limit your, uh, your testimony to five minutes. Your entire written statement will be made part of the record. You've got a clock in front of you that'll count down from five minutes. Uh, green light means you're good to go. Uh, yellow light means speed up. Uh, you've only got a minute left. And uh, red light means please uh, wrap it up. Also, please remember to turn your microphones on since we're uh, budget conscious here in Washington. We don't buy the most expensive fancy microphone, so it will help everyone here. The closer you are to the microphone, the better chance we have of hearing you well. Um, so at this point, we'll start with Ms. Snyder. You're recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify before you today on the issue of current shark finning laws in the global shark fin trade. My name is Laura Snyder. I'm the director of Oceana's Shark and Responsible Fishing Campaigns. Oceana is supportive of efforts in Congress to conserve shark populations, including the Shark Fin Sales Elimination Act, which would prohibit the sale and possession of shark fins in the United States. As predators, sharks play vital roles in ecosystems all over the world. However, some species are now in serious trouble. Some populations have declined by more than 90%, and if more action is not taken, other populations could share a similar fate. This could be damaging to the ocean ecosystem and to commercial fishers as their target species become depleted due to the unchecked growth of mid-level predators. These declines are disturbing for those in the diving and tourism industry as well. A recent report found that shark-related dives in Florida generated more than $221 in direct expenditures and fueled over 3,700 jobs in 2016. This stands in stark contrast to the entire shark fin industry in the United States, which exported less than $1 million of fins last year. The demand for shark fins is one of the main reasons for declines in shark populations. Every year, up to 73 million sharks end up in the global shark fin trade. The demand for these fins fuels shark finning, the act of slicing the fins off a shark and dumping its body back at sea, where it will drown, bleed to death, or eat, even be eaten alive by other fish. As you mentioned, this practice is illegal in US waters. Congress has already passed two bills to ban shark finning, which have increased protections for sharks, but more needs to be done, as these laws did not get to the root of the problem. Too many sharks are being killed to fulfill the demand for shark fin soup. New studies have revealed that 91% of the fins in the global trade are from unsustainable sources. The U.S. continues to import shark fins from countries that do not have bans on finning, and cases of finning are still being uncovered. To help ensure that they aren't, aren't participating in this damaging trade, 12 states and three territories have already banned the trade of shark fins. Private corporations are also refusing to ship or sell shark fin products, including Amazon and Grubhub. Over 50% of international airlines have now banned shark fins, as have 17 of the 19 biggest shipping lines. However, as companies and states close the door on the fin trade, other doors remain open and the market shifts accordingly. For example, after a number of states enacted their bans, trade activity in the United States shifted primarily to Texas. Texas then passed the ban and now we've seen that the trade has moved to Georgia. We are engaging in a game of whack-a-mole. As one state closes its door, activity pops up elsewhere. On a national scale, 
the United States is actively importing fins from countries such as China that do not have comparable finning regulations as the United States. In addition, it's unclear how many fins are coming into this country. According to a report by the Food and Agricultural Organization, other countries report sending seven times as many shark fins as the US reported receiving. Even more disturbing, according to NOAA's database, fins are still being imported and exported from some states that have bans on buying and selling and transporting and possession of shark fins. Congress has made its stance clear on this issue, and yet we still are creating economic incentive for the act to continue. Fins from fin sharks, even likely including fins from sharks that are threatened or endangered, are being bought and sold in the United States. Additionally, previous laws did not address the main problem. Too many sharks are being killed, in large part due to the demand for their fins. But this is a solvable problem. A national ban like the Shark Fin Sales Elimination Act would solve many of these issues. As the U.S. has led the world in fisheries management and in halting the trade of other trafficked wildlife products like ivory and rhino horns, so too should we reclaim our role as a leader and show the world that we will not contribute to the demand for fins. We should not participate in the trade of a product that hurts shark populations, especially given the fact that sharks are critical to maintaining healthy and abundant oceans. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Assistant Commander Reeder, you're recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Farenthold, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Brandi Reeder, and I'm an Assistant Commander Game Warden and the Fisheries Law Administrator for the Texas Parks and Wildlife Law Enforcement Division. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about this very important topic. I'm hopeful that my testimony will provide you with useful information to help you in your examination of federal regulations prohibiting shark finning. The Texas Parks and Wildlife Department is the state agency primarily responsible for management of native species and enforcement of statutes and regulations promulgated to ensure protection of the state's natural resources. We work closely with the U.S. Coast Guard, uh, NOAA, Office of Law Enforcement, U.S. Fish and Wildlife and Border Patrol to ensure state and federal fishery priorities are addressed. Texas has 376 miles of coastline and approximately 4 million surface acres of saltwater that we're responsible for managing. Coastal Fisheries Creel Surveys and the Commercial Trip Ticket Data Program supplied in my written testimony, it is, in, it is evident that the shark fishery in Texas is minimal. The commercial shark trade in Texas has been almost non-existent for many years. While recreational fishing pressure remains high, there appears to be a slight decline in harvest. Recreational catch and release of sharks appears to be increasing. The practice of shark finning has only been observed in limited instances over the course of the last 10 years. As you are obviously aware of the passage of Representative Lucio III's House Bill 1579, I won't go too, in, too far into how that was built. However, I will say that it was, a, it was a comprehensive piece of legislation that was proactively put in place to combat shark finning in Texas. The bill uh, came into statute in uh, July of 2017, and it provided an offense to buy, sell, offer for sell, possess for purpose of sale, transport, or shipment for the purpose of sale, barter, or exchange of shark fin. It provides a Class B misdemeanor, with enhanced penalties to a Class A misdemeanor, which uh, puts in place potentially up to a $4,000 fine and up to one year of jail. This is a very uh, aggressive penalty and will help serve as a deterrent to the behavior. Uh, in the first year of the implementation of the statute, we made sure to inform the public through press release, and uh, we've ha we have found overall that through education and, and through this statute, it's been very easy to enforce as mere possession of a shark car carcass without, without fins or possession of shark fins themselves uh, for any commercial purpose is a violation. We've had uh, a few instances to where we've, we've observed shark fin cases. We had two back in 2012. And the most recent is in September of this year in which we had the Animal F Welfare Institute had notified us of possible violations in certain uh, restaurants. So following up on that, uh, two of our game wardens found shark fins in a restaurant and then were directed over to a uh, local retail shop and found 38 more shark fins. Uh, well, it was incomplete shark carcasses and 44 cases were filed. During that case, it was obvious that both parties knew that the uh, that possession of the shark fins were illegal. 
moving on, is illegal launch, Mexican lancha incursions in Texas state waters is still a problem. The illegal fishing activities continue in Texas state waters. Unfortunately, it is difficult to estimate the impact of this illegal fishing on shark populations off of Texas. Since 2011, Texas game wardens have seized over 25,000 miles of illegal gill net and over 20 miles of illegal longline from the Gulf of Mexico. Sharks are commonly caught in, the, in this gear. The United States Coast Guard estimated 800,000 pounds of red snapper have been illegally harvested annually during incursions of Mexican launches between 2013 and 2014. US Coast, Guards, U.S. Coast Guard and Texas Parks and Wildlife Game Wardens have seen a reduction in sharks retained in launch encounters as the market for red snappers increased dramatically. Fewer sharks are being uh, observed in confiscated gill nets and longline gear. Anecdotally, recent shark encounters have been only a quarter of the numbers observed in previous years. When, uh, let me see here. Uh, the United States Coast Guard continues to cite and intercept a large number of launches each year. The problem does not appear to have de decreased even with focused enforcement efforts. In summary, shark fishing is not a large fishery in Texas, commercially or recreationally, resulting in few observed cases of shark finning during patrols in state waters. Sharks offered for sale in Texas typically come from either interstate or foreign imports. The recent encounter of shark fins in the restaurant in the Dallas-Fort Worth area imported, were imported from another state, offered as an off-menu item. This suggests that there may be an underground market for this product. While in the retail establishment, it was clear the manager knew possession of the shark carcasses without fins was illegal, and the individual tried to remove the remaining carcasses from the freezer where they were found. The proactive statute developed by Texas Representative Lucia III and passed in 2015 provided penalties which are strong enough that repeated violation is not anticipated. Law enforcement experience demonstrates that regulations or statutes must provide penalties sufficient to deter the behavior on the first violation as subsequent offenses become more difficult to detect as future sales will be conducted more covertly. Cooperative targeted enforcement efforts between state and federal law enforcement are critical to discontinue shark fending across the United States. This concludes my testimony and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Dr. Dove, you're recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon, committee members, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Dr. Alistair Dove, and I'm the Vice President of Research and Conservation Programs at the Georgia Aquarium in Atlanta, which is a non-profit organization inspiring awareness and preservation of our oceans and aquatic animals worldwide. I'm a broadly trained uh, marine biologist with a current focus on the biology and conservation of whale sharks and manta rays, which I've been studying around the world for the last 10 years. U.S. shark fisheries are better managed than those of most countries, and for some species at least, may even meet the definition of being sustainable over the long term. But in relative terms, it's not an especially high value fishery. Sharks make up just 0.12% of the value of all U.S. fisheries, and shark fins make up less than a quarter of that tiny fraction. In fact, sharks are more valuable alive for the ecosystem services they provide, or as the targets for wildlife tourism. A recent analysis from Oceana showed that one in five scuba diving trips in Florida was specifically targeted at sharks, and together these provided $126 million worth of uh, value to the economy and supported over 3,800 jobs in Florida alone. That's 19 times more than the combined value of all commercial shark landings in the United States. But given the expertise of some of my fellow witnesses, I think I'd like to focus my comments more on uh, the importance of sharks for a healthy marine ecosystem. We need a healthy ocean because it provides half of the oxygen we breathe. Literally every second breath you're taking today uh, was provided by the ocean. Protein for billions of people every day, a buffer against climate change, and the greatest repository of undiscovered medicines on the planet, as well as a means to conduct more than 90% of international commerce through shipping. And a healthy ocean needs healthy shark populations. There are nearly 500 species of sharks, so it's important not to overgeneralize their biology or to imagine that every shark looks like a great white, a tiger, or a hammerhead. Uh, there are sharks that are as small as six inches when they're fully grown, and the two largest species, the basking shark and the whale shark, are not toothy predators, but peaceful, filter-feeding giants, ostensibly more similar to whales than their toothier relatives. Many, many species of sharks are drab, deep sea species that feed on small invertebrates near the bottom, and many of these species are poorly known to science. It's important to recognize that new species of sharks are still being discovered on a regular basis. 
But with regard to the more familiar types, an ocean without large predatory sharks is like a sky without eagles or the Serengeti without lions. Science has repeatedly shown us that removal of these top-level sharks can cause a domino effect with significant impacts on the rest of the food web in a process that scientists call a trophic cascade. This appears especially to be the case uh, on coral reefs where sharks are often the top-level predators but also the second-tier predators like the smaller uh, grey reef sharks, black tip sharks, white tip sharks and things like that. Many marine biologists will tell you a handy rule of thumb about the health of ocean ecosystems is that if you go scuba diving and you don't see a shark, uh, there is a problem. And conversely, the richest and most productive ecosystems the world over are those with vibrant shark populations. I've been lucky enough to witness this firsthand in the Galapagos Marine Reserve at a place called Darwin's Arch, which is home to enormous schools of tuna and jacks and other pelagic and reef fishes. But it's also home to healthy populations of Galapagos sharks, silky sharks, black tip sharks, the largest whale sharks in the world, and schools of scalloped hammerhead sharks too numerous to count. According to one published study, Darwin's Arch may have the highest shark density anywhere in the world, and yet it's overflowing with other types of marine life as well. It seems counterintuitive in some way, but nonetheless it's true. Sharks have been fulfilling their key roles in the ocean for nearly 400 million years, which is millions of years before dinosaurs or indeed any other land vertebrates. But unfortunately, their life history has a critical flaw, that they tend to be long-lived, late to mature, and have relatively few well-developed offspring. It's actually a reproductive strategy that's quite similar to our own. Uh, but unfortunately, this means uh, that they're very sensitive to disturbance, and it can take a very long time for shark populations to recover if they get knocked back. And this makes them a poor target for fisheries, certainly compared to a bony fish like a herring, for example, uh, whose life cycle is done in just a couple of years uh, and can lay millions of eggs during that period. And this is perhaps why so few shark fisheries have achieved certification for long-term sustainability. In summary, the market demand for shark fins and meat has historically provided powerful incentives for over-harvesting of shark populations uh, internationally and here in the US. Science shows us that some US species may be able to support sustainable fisheries, but the life history of most shark species makes them populations sensitive to disturbance and slow to recover. It's essential that we effectively regulate shark fisheries and restore those species that are already depleted because the healthy shark populations are needed if we want the ocean to continue to provide us with new medicines, food, and the very air that we breathe. Thank you. Thank you, and seeing as how we have not yet called votes, we'll get started with some questioning. We'll start with uh, uh, the gentleman from uh, Kentucky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Snyder, good to see you again. In your experience, can you elaborate on the response of restaurateurs in states that have banned shark finning? Um, yes, thank you. Um, so in California, California was one of the first states to pass a ban, um, and uh, during that there was some pushback from some of the restaurant community. But as um, more and more states pass bans, um, we saw that le we didn't see it as much. Um, and you know, there's been a lot of really amazing efforts done by groups like Wild Aid and Yao Ming of raising awareness of these issues. So um, I would say back you know, a few years ago that we, we saw a response, but we haven't been hearing anything lately. Okay. Uh, Ms. Reeder, there have been reported issues with Mexican fishermen illegally sharking in Texas waters. What has Texas law enforcement done to attempt to combat this practice? Thank you. We work con in cooperation with the U.S. Coast Guard. We've made targeted enforcement through our border operations and, uh, and we put focused effort on the border to try and limit and uh, deter Great. these incursions. Uh, Dr. Dove, do you feel that sustainable shark fisheries is a potential solution to the problem? Why or why not? So it, it's important that we uh, separate the issues of sustainable shark fisheries for meat and, and fisheries that are related specifically to the, to the fin trade. I think it's important that we uh, probably discourage the fin trade in any form, uh, but it, do, it is possible, according to fishery scientists, that some, fish, some shark species can be fished sustainably, species like the spiny dogfish on the east coast of the United States. So uh, it, it's always important when we talk about this question to separate the issues of, of fishing for fins and fishing for meat. And I think in the case of fins, 
it's losing popularity in China. The consumption is down about 80% since 2014. So uh, I think it's time to uh, let this practice go and, and for the United States to take a lead role in setting an example to not encourage that behavior to persist anymore. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield my time back. Thank you very much. We'll now uh, recognize the ranking member, the gentlelady from the U.S. Virgin Islands, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Dove and Ms. Snyder, I wanted to ask you uh, with regard to climate change. Um, do you agree that climate change, or do you believe that climate change has caused the warming of our oceans? Yes, and as the director of responsible fishing at Oceana, um, so the shellfish industry in the United States is worth about $3 billion. And we know with ocean acidification that there could be negative impacts for, for that industry that we're already seeing in the um, Pacific Northwest for some of the oyster farms. And the warming is causing, what is that, how does that affect the, the shellfish? So the, with any change in the chemistry of the water, that the, um, the shells, which are hard, it can impact um, their ability to be strong, essentially. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Dr. Dove? Yes, we know since the uh, beginning of the Industrial Revolution that the ocean has absorbed more than 25% of the additional carbon dioxide emissions and almost 90% of the heat. So the ocean's been doing us a huge favor for a very long time in absorbing a lot of these emissions. But the, the scientific consensus is clear that, that, that climate change is a real thing. And I think most scientists have moved on these days to addressing uh, what is the severity of the impact going to be and what steps can we take to ameliorate those impacts to, to minimize uh, uh, the effect on, on society. So in the amelioration of that and what can be done, um, you talked about healthy oceans as a buffer. Could you elaborate on that? So healthy oceans have a number of different perspectives. We would love to see oceans that are abundant, producing you know, plenty of food and, and medicines and other uh, ecosystem services like that. But they provide other intangible services too, including the protection of coastlines from, from storms uh, that would, uh, which I don't need to tell you anything about that. Sure. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's a very important service that we get from the ocean. Uh, and, and it's directly and, and intimately tied to the relationship between uh, uh, carbon pollution and the warming and acidification of oceans. When you talk about that, I know in the Virgin Islands in particular, our coral reefs are really important um, to keeping sharks and as well as, um, you know, regulating the amount of waves that come into the general vicinity of our beaches. <clears throat> and the coral's health really has a lot to do with the warming of the ocean. Um, Doctor, again, Dr. Dove and Ms. Schneider, could you each briefly describe for us the effect of climate change in the form of warming on sharks and other aquatic life besides shell, shellfish? I'll go first this time. Uh, so we know uh, in the case of sharks, uh, they are cold-blooded animals and their, their metabolism is driven by the prevailing temperature. So the more things warm up, uh, the, the more their metabolic demands increase. And with respect to acidification, which is the other, the flip side of, of carbon pollution in the ocean, more acidic oceans make it hard for sharks to smell their way around, which they live in a, an olfactory world. They smell their way around and, and acidification has been demonstrated to change the way sharks sense their environment and impact the way they can smell uh, their food, and that's that's an, a problem for them. Well, th th would it help them s not just s smell their food, but maybe smell prey or those that are atta an attack against them? Exactly. So it, it may it may affect them in both uh, in their roles, especially if they're lower level sharks, uh, uh, meso predator sharks, we would call them. They have to be able to smell prey, but they also have to be able to smell predators that might be after them as well. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Schneider? Yes, I'll just add that in some of the studies, they did show that the sharks were more lethargic. And then there was also a study that looked at the taking away of so many sharks and how that um, impacted, it could potentially impact populations that eat seagrass. Mm. And seagrass is, um, you know, very good at, at, at capturing carbon. And so when they were, uh, you remove too many sharks, and that that next level um, booms, that there are impacts on the amounts of um, CO2 released from that. In fact, I think the study said that it was equal to all the cars in Australia. Good, great. And could you tell us um, what could we be doing as legislators to um, combat this and to assist? Well, again, from the fisheries perspective, we do know that with changing um, uh, 
ocean temperatures that some fish stocks are shifting. So I think as we're thinking about how to manage our fishery stocks, we need to be taking that into account and, and, having, and dedicating science to seeing where are the fish moving and how can we better manage those populations. Okay, Dr. Dove. Yeah, I think it's important as we go forward that we, that we fill some of the knowledge gaps that we have about the impact of, of climate change. It's one of the most active areas of research right now. So how would we as legislators facilitate that for you? So through support of basic science research through the National Science Foundation and NOAA and other agencies that provide funding for basic research across the country that can help answer some of those questions. Thank you. Perfect. My time is up. I yield back. You hit that right on the mark. I should be so lucky. Well, we may finish this before the uh, before the vote, so we, we we appreciate it. But I do have a I do have a couple of questions, and we'll start with uh, uh, Dr. Dove, and we'll, we'll let Ms. Snyder weigh in on this. Uh, the shark finning trade is basically takes the fin because it's the most valuable piece uh, of the shark for whatever whatever properties it uh, people believe it has. Um, the shark finning legislation uh, typically prevent, prevents finning the shark and just taking the fin. And I think Ms. Reeder testified that they did have the whole shark in the restaurant uh, that they busted in the Dallas-Fort Worth um, area. Is shark meat a desirable uh, fish for serving a restaurant or for uh, human consumption? And uh, why yes, why no? Well, the values of the U.S. shark fishery, uh, the U.S. fishery landings in total would argue not. I mean, you can look at the total value of shark fisheries in the United States at about $6.6 .6 million in 2015 and compare that to crab, which is $678 million, more than 100 times more than the shark fishery. So I think people uh, vote with their taste buds a little bit and they'll tell you that uh, those, those relative values will tell you about what are the most valued fisheries. That's not to say there isn't a place for shark or even a place for sustainably harvested shark. It's just so difficult to thread the needle on shark fin and make that worth doing, uh, the market, sim market value simply isn't there, if you ask me. So. Ms. Snyder, did you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I just think it's important to note when you look at the most popular species in the Hong Kong um, fin trade, you look at those specific 14 species and over 70% of them are at high risk or very high risk of, of extinction. So as Dr. Dove mentioned, there's around 500 species of sharks. So when you look at the ones that are the most popular, a number of them are in serious trouble. So, so as a sportsman, you know, I've always been taught to you, you eat what you shoot, you eat what you catch. And so in, in Hong Kong, you, you, they're only selling the fins, they're not selling the rest of the shark because there's little, they consider there to be little economic value there. Is that correct? I don't know that you could say that there's no shark meat there, but um, a bowl of shark fin soup it can go for over $100. Um, and so, um, you know, and that's and, higher than Washington, D.C. prices for food. <laughs> yes, it is. But you also can look like for the hammerhead. So um, a number of hammerhead species are, um, you know, face serious declines and are listed under um, international agreements of needing um, additional protection. And you look at the price, even in the Gulf of Mexico, that a price per pound for the meat compared to the price per pound for the fin. So the meat goes for 25 cents. And then the fin can go for over sixteen dollars per pound, the ex vessel price. All right, Ms. Uh, Reeder, you you do enforcement in Texas. Do you see do you see a lot of uh, recreational fishermen actually keeping their shark, or is it more of a catch and release uh, a sport? Do you, do you have any numbers on that? We don't have numbers on on how whether they are retained or whether they're uh, done in cotton release. Um, the thing is, is that overall the fishery itself is not very large on the recreational end. We do have uh, plenty of recreational fishermen who really love that sport and are avid about it, uh, which is why I believe that we have seen more catch and release of sharks. Uh, I do want to make one small correction, though, is that on the case that we had in Dallas, right. some of those carcasses were actually cut in a way that there were not the, the fillets were not available. They were actually harvested or, or cut in a, and processed in a manner in which it was really just the back meat, just a right. very limited amount of back meat, and the anal and caudal fins were left. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate that clarification. What's your biggest challenge in dealing with uh, the, the shark fin trade as a law enforcement person? 
I'd say that in the end is that if it goes covert, it becomes so much more difficult to detect our officers. So to give you an example, we have 551 sworn game wardens in the state of Texas. Uh, we have a handful of dedicated investigators. So whenever you take those numbers and you put it to a covert operation to where you're having to involve your investigators, you reduce your capabilities. Um, so you reduce your effectiveness. So as this, um, as, as we deploy more efforts to detect and deter this behavior, if it goes to a more covert and underground market, it's going to be more difficult to combat. And, and that's why you're an advocate of strong penalties for a first offense. Is that Absolutely. Correct? All right. Finally, uh, Ms. Snyder, uh, you mentioned that, uh, I believe it was you, the, the panel did mention that a demand for shark finning in China, which is kind of a hub for that, or shark fin, is going down. Do we know why that's uh, going down, and is that something we can help uh, perhaps deal with on the demand side? I, I, it was actually Dr. Dove who uh, right. mentioned that, but I can speak to it a little bit, and then you can yeah. jump in there right. as So well. I'm out of time. I'll let you finish, then Dr. Dove, and I'll technically be within the rule because I've quit talking. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, I would say... You know, that there have been, um, I mentioned Wild Aid and Yao Ming and a lot of really positive um, efforts in China. In addition, the Chinese government had made it illegal to serve shark fin soup at government functions. And then you also saw the three state-owned um, Chinese airlines have also put bans in, sh in shipping shark fins. And Chinese shipping companies have, have as well. And that there's been a lot of activism within, within China of raising awareness for this. So that could be, um, in large part, why. But I will also let, let Dr. Duff speak to that. So I understand that there are three main reasons why it's, it's declined in China. The first is the, the aforementioned campaigns from Wild Aid and WWF and Yao Ming and others. Um, uh, the, that's the, uh, when, the killing, when the buying stops the killing can too campaign. But there's also a group of uh, pro-environment uh, business leaders in China who have been advocating for uh, better, better actions on, um, on sharks and shark fins. Uh, but I understand that one of the biggest impacts was an austerity measure from, from uh, Xi Jinping that uh, essentially in Instructed all state party officials to to limit uh, expensive activities, not just shark fin soup, but cigarettes and alcohol and other activities too. So um, it was a, a sort of a case of, uh, you know, uh, 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 in type of environmentalism that came from a central authority. So. All right, thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Plaskin. Unless you have something else. Uh, all right, I want to uh, say thanks again for you guys uh, coming up. Uh, and thank them for all the work. Yes, and absolutely. Thank you for, uh, for, for all the work you are doing. Uh, sometimes uh, it, it is thankless uh, doing what you do, and, but we certainly appreciate it. And uh, as you can see by some of the legislation that we've discussed today, it is something that we're aware of here in Washington, D.C., and uh, hopefully can uh, continue to, uh, to move forward on this. So um, I want to thank you again for appearing. The hearing uh, record will remain open for two weeks for any member to submit uh, written opening statements uh, or questions for the record. If we do get any questions, we'll uh, get in touch with you and see if you could answer those in writing, and we'll include those uh, in the record. If there's no further business without objection, the subcommittee will stand adjourned. Thank you.